tiny little torch sinks a large freighter off Boiler Bay. Okay, good. It was a blowtorch that may have been similar to this that caused the final demise of the J. Marhofer, which lent the boiler ended up in its final resting place in Boiler there Bay was in 19... The ship's engineer was down below deck starting a torch up like this and what you would do, you'd, you'd pump it up like this, this torch, and then you would open the valve like that and hold something over the end of it here till this little tray got full of gasoline then you would shut it off and you'd take a, a match probably was using a match similar to this and light this tray of gas and then the gas would heat this this main burner up on it uh, there's a little shield here so it would direct the heat up toward this and then when that got hot and the gas burned out then you'd turn it on like this and it would just roar it, they were a really good torch once you got them going but but they could be quite dangerous starting them and particularly as they did on the J. Marhofer he was starting at a, in pretty heavy seas and probably the gas was slopping out of this all over everything and it started all the old bunker oil and everything that was splattered around the engine room out and so it it just exploded and then uh, they couldn't get the fire out and they wanted to flood the captain said flood the engine room but uh, the valves were too hot to handle so they couldn't do that and they couldn't even stop the ship because it was oil fired an old coal fired ship you could they would have ran out of fuel eventually and stopped but not the modern oil fueled ones and so then it crashed on the rocks and blew up with a spectacular explosion all because of a torch that probably looked just about like this and I don't know what he was doing with the torch but it's got a spot here and there was a hook up here where you could put a soldering iron on it so he may have been soldering a bucket or, or a tub or something or maybe he was heating a bolt to to loosen it. Uh, history doesn't really tell why he was starting the torch, just that he did and it exploded. Okay. The J. Marhofer was a 175 foot, 600 ton steam schooner. They set sail out of San Francisco with a course charted for Portland, Oregon, their home port. They rounded Yaquin ahead, doing pretty good at about eight or nine knots. Then the ship's mechanic was down below deck working on a gasoline fired blowtorch when the thing exploded. Since the Marhofer was an oil fired ship there was plenty of oil spattered around the engine room to really make that fire go the captain gave the order uh, to flood the engine room but the valves were far too hot to touch so their only option was to take to a life raft which was quite a task running at full bore they ste he steered a course right for shore and turned the ship loose while they took to the life raft. They were going to come in at what is now Fogarty Creek State Park, but there was a woman frantically waving a, a red shirt, and they took this as a danger sign and went paddled on north till they came to another beach. 
The tragedy struck when they started to come in on the beach, though. The ship's cook drowned. Marge and I have decided to climb down the very steep bank into what is now Boiler Bay and then walk around just above the low tide line and see if we can find this historical old boiler laying in the edge of the water. The trip down was a might be a little difficult for some people and you should always keep an eye on the tide when going down here. It could come in behind you and you might be stuck out there. We find that we have to go down below some of these little crevices down next to the water to get around them. But so far we're able to get around them. We see scads of sea life, right? in the intertidal zone and just piles of mussels and some sea anemones are setting in a little tidal pool waiting for the water to come in. Then we look ahead and suddenly there's the ill-fated boiler. It looks as if it's laying upside down in the edge of the surf. It's covered with some sea life and rust red with rust it has there was welding wasn't real common at the time this boiler was made so there's just scads of rivets on it and you can still see the places where they bolted it down the little ears on it for bolting it down and it's laid here for about 110 years, I guess it is. And when it hit, it hit with a spectacular explosion. The captain couldn't turn the motor down since it was an oil-fueled steam engine. He couldn't shut her down because everything got so hot they couldn't touch it. So they had to go on the tricky thing of abandoning, sh abandoning ship at full bore, the Marhofer crashed on the rocks here, and there was a tremendous fire and a big explosion from the boiler and other th and fuel tanks that sent debris flying everywhere. We couldn't have picked a better time to go down and see the boiler of the J. Marhofer than right now at last light of day and low tide. The rivets just show up really good and we're able to go right up to the boiler. It can be seen at low tide or even uh, a halfway low tide. You can see it if you know where to look, but it's a little difficult to find from up on top but it can be done. After our trip to see the J. Marhofer and watching the shiny little tide pools without a breath of breeze, it's time for us to head back out. We see some little crabs of different kinds hiding, making their presence unknown to us almost under a rock. And now it's time to make the climb back up out of here. It's a little tricky at first, but someone's brought a rope and left there. Although it isn't difficult enough that what you might be able to make it without the rope. But the rope sure helps. And they put an old plastic net float at the bottom of it so you can see it from down below. And I'm making my way up one step at a time. Someone's even taken the trouble to carve some steps. There's a sign here that tells you what you can and can't take. This is a protected area, so it's probably best to take nothing from down there. It's kind of a historical thing and a protected area where 
I think you might be able to take a few muscles to cook and eat, but probably not much else. We get in the pickup. We've pulled off on a little pull-off. It's about a quarter of a mile north of Boiler Bay rest area. Our daughter, Annette, and her friend, Francisco, and dog, Oscar, and myself decide to go up to Fogarty Creek Park. That's where the crew of the Marhofer originally planned to come in on the beach till they saw this red shirt waving and headed to the next beach north. And I'm not certain where the cook drowned, but I think it was there. We park in the parking lot, walk under the 101 bridge, and then through the sand down to the beach. We see there's been a breeze blowing and lots of the bull whip kelp have drift up on the beach here at Fogarty Creek. These bullwhip kelp, there's a big patch of them right outside Fogarty Creek, and they have a float so they can be in 20 foot of water or even more and send their little float up that sets on the surface. We see all sorts of sea life, some animal and others plant, and the dog is having a blast on the beach as we look around and try to envision where this boat came up on shore. And that's found a piece of sea life that she's examining very carefully. On the rocks out there, there's just no end to the different kinds of sea life that you'll find clinging for all dear life to the rock. And even a starfish has been cast up on the beach, upside down and far to ground. We find some more of the bullwhip, and that's holding one of the bullwhip kelp. And we look at around where the roots were attached, and we see other types of animals in the roots. There are little worms and tiny little starfish and everything if you look in the cast-off roots of the bullwhip. And then we see some of the fronds from it. And each of the fronds have little floats. The little marks on it are little floats to make it float. And then the, the stem itself is hollow with a big hollow tube at the top which makes them float very well. Some seagulls are on their perch high on top of one of the boulders at Fogarty Creek. And this is where the woman was ra waving a red sweatshirt frantically that the crew of the J. Marhofer took as a warning signal. We look around up above high tide line and we see fossils just thousands of them in the sandstone rock they're just all over the place you can see uh, mostly uh, clam and the pectin or uh, or scallop shells and they're embedded in the rock and they're starting to erode out just a little bit at a time as we rock around the rocky shore at Fogarty Creek Park. And this is where the captain was going to bring his life raft in, but decided against it when he saw that red shirt waving frantically in the ocean breeze. The oceans eroded out several shells here. This looks to be a scallop or a pectin shell and all sorts of other clam shells just almost all over the place down along the rocky shores at Fogarty Creek State Park. On the way back we decided to stop and take a look 
at this piece of wreckage from the J. Marhofer. I think it might have been their smokestack, but I'm not certain of that. I've never really been on big ships to know something like that. And then we look right from the edge of Highway 101. If you look in the right place and the tide isn't too high, you can see the remains of the wreck of the J. Marhofer. For anyone wanting to witness this solemn reminder to a bygone era of shipping, you can go to, day, to Boiler Bay State Wayside and then walk about or drive about a little over a quarter of a mile north on 101, pull off on a wide spot where there's room for three or four cars, park there and find this sign. It's within sight of where you're parking, but you have to look a little bit to find it and stand right where that sign is and look slightly north and you'll find it.